<laughs> hey, look, uh, guys. So my, my name is Fletcher Wimbush. Uh, I'm the owner of The Higher Talent. And we are uh, really we're excited because we're bringing uh, one of our latest products to the market. It's Discovered. It's a performance hiring software. It's more than an ATS. Uh, but it's a bird. It's a plane. It's a uh, super hiring platform is what we like to think of it as. Uh, we're really at our core. We're talent assessment people. Uh, but we and the reason why we're so excited to talk to a guy like Adam, who is a talent acquisition expert is in our journey, being talent assessment people, we really early on learned how important it is to be able to fill your funnel with high quality people. And that means you got to be an excellent recruitment marketer, recruiter, talent, just all around talent acquisition person. And so I've spent the last 10 years of my life just getting better at those things. I, I, mean, I mean, I know a lot about figuring out who's good and assessing people, but getting them into the funnel so that we can you know, get to a final conclusion has been a, a new journey in my life that I spent 10 years. And I'm still learning a lot. So, you know, uh, Adam, you know, we've been kind of following you on LinkedIn and and was really impressed with you and what your company uh, IQ Talent Partners is doing because in respect, the angle that you guys take is you guys take a kind of a different approach to talent acquisition, right? You, and the theme of this is sort of breaking the contingency model, right? And I think probably anybody here listening to this has probably had some frustrations with the contingency recruiting model, if not a lot. And uh, I really like what, the way you guys approach it. And so maybe you can share a little bit about how you ended up as, you know, A, a talent acquisition expert, but B, it would, you know, IQ Talent Partners and what you guys are doing and give us a little bit of perspective there. Absolutely. Um, so I guess uh, I appreciate being called a talent acquisition expert. You know, that's a, it's been a goal of mine at some point to be an expert in something. So I'm going to take this one and run, run with it. Uh, so like most, I feel like it's like this, this standard answer of talent acquisition professionals is how did you get into it and how did you become good at it? You fall into it. Yeah. Um, 16, 17 years ago, I, quite frankly, I needed a job. I had a friend that was a recruiter, didn't even know what that really meant. Uh, called her and asked if she would help help me. And she goes, well, my company's hiring. You want to interview? And at that point, I needed a job. So you dang right, I want to interview. Um, <laughs> 16 years later, here I am. I started out on the, the staffing contingency model, what we're talking about here. Uh, moved my way into the corporate side, have helped uh, implement applicant tracking systems, have built recruiting departments, rebuilt recruiting departments. Um, and now I'm here at IQ Talent. And uh, you're right, we... Uh, I like to say we, we're trying to be the disruptors a little bit of this model, um, of the contingency model. And the main reason is, is there's a lot of companies out there that need a lot of talent and they need someone to be able to be, be willing to focus on it, knowing that for lack of a better way, they don't have the thousands and thousands of dollars a contingency uh, search will cost them. And they don't know, they just don't know any different. So that's what they think they have to do. So we wanna come in and do it differently um, the best way I can say it, and I think we talked uh, the first time we talked, I call us the add-on of talent acquisition. Yeah. You tell us where you need us to fit in, whether it's filling that top of the funnel, like you said, go out and finding the people, uh, go out and recruit the people. Any thing you need us to do, we kind of morph ourselves into it. And instead of charging you this huge fee um, for one placement, we're going to charge you by the hour. And quite frankly, as long as you need us, we'll fill as many roles as we possibly can for that same hourly rate. So it allows companies that don't have the deepest pockets to still have access to the talent that's out there. And that's, and that's really what we're here for is we want to, we want to help people get the people they need to whatever they're trying to do in their industry. If they're trying to disrupt, well, how do they get to it? And to, have, to be able to bring in an expert talent acquisition team who can be spun up in like seconds. Well, you know, I'm exaggerating, but very, very <laughs> fast, right? Because yeah. Just picture this, right? You're a startup or I mean, you do a lot, right? In healthcare, healthcare tech, like, um, or tech in general, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's where we focus on is we're really in that. And like you said, it's, we call ourselves on demand. I always joke and say we're the add on, but we're on demand. So really, if you come in and say, hey, I'm in a hiring sprint, I just got my series B funding and I have to hire so that I can now start matching the goals that my investors have. Well, what if you don't have a talent acquisition team? How do you do that? Well, traditionally, people would go out to go out to a contingency search firm and say, yeah, I have to just hire. And you don't know, they don't know your culture. They're not ingrained in what you're looking for. 
and they're going to charge you a ridiculous amount of money to do it. We're saying, hold on. I already have the professionals. I have the, the scalable process. I just need to know how many roles you need to fill and I can model it out. And we're going to be cost effective and cost efficient for you while really being part of your company while we'll do it. And, and you, we're watching these startups thrive because some of the, some of the ability we've had. And that's, I mean, there's so many places I want to talk about this, but you just yeah. hit on a button, like I'm going to be part of your company, right? Like, yeah. so there's two pieces of this. So if, if, if I'm a startup tech company or whatever, or if I'm a small business, so I do a lot with SMB, right? And, you know, I guess you should consider SMB, but they're fast growth. They've got a bunch of cash. They try to go do things really, but traditional SMB, right? You know, they're bootstrapped, they're fun, self-funded, you know, they move, they move at a slower pace. But again, they can't, so neither of these groups can go and hire a talent acquisition expert like you. I mean, it might cost them a quarter million or more right, to really get that true expert person in there. And to maybe fill a couple of roles, can't justify that. Uh, let alone for, you know, uh, uh, let alone find that person, Like, right? So finding <laughs> a great talent acquisition person to fill that role is a very difficult task in itself, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And we, I mean, and, and you kind of nailed it. That, that's why we, I enjoy this model. And again, I came from being on the corporate side and traditional staffing that did contract, contract to perm and contingency. Yeah. One of the things that I always had an issue with is even when I wanted to have the best, the best of intentions, at the end of the day, my compensation was going to be affected by how many placements I had. Mm -hmm. So what happens is I stopped seeing the person in the company in front of me. And I started seeing how quickly can I fill this role to move on to the next one? Yeah. Well, I, I'm not, now I'm just looking for profile. I'm not looking for a person. In our model, I can come in and say, I can ramp up extremely quickly. I can ingrain myself into your culture extremely quickly. We have a proven scalable process where we come in and we have specific questions that we ask to everyone to make sure that we, I always say, you hand a recruiter a job description, they'll hand you back a profile. Yeah. Well, that that's fine. That doesn't mean the person's going to be successful to kind of like what you're talking about, that assessment piece. We really try culture to understand fit, right? the culture, uh, the right? Tangible stuff. Uh, yeah. My, my favorite question to ask hiring managers is job description is fantastic. Thank you for getting me that. Tell me who this person is. Yeah. How, yeah. Is, what problem are they going to solve? Right. The job description doesn't tell you that. So I sit there and I ask those questions. And now I can come up and I can build a plan with my internal team, my IQ talent team and say, okay, we got to scale this quickly. This is how we're going to do it. And this is the amount of hours that we're going to use per week to get this accomplished. Then I'm going to set up my weekly cadence with, with the hiring manager and my team that I'm working with internally. And I'm literally going to be the extension of what they already have if they have a TA department, or I'm going to help them establish best practices. So if they do get to the point, they can hire a TA team. They already know what good is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that, and that changes the game for these companies that just, that they don't know, right. It's not their fault. There's so many companies out there that have brilliant minds yet their brilliant minds aren't geared towards hiring. And, I just and, have a, a and that's a, one of my pet peeves, right? I run these polls on LinkedIn and everybody here chime in, like, tell me who here was trained to hire, to recruit, hire, or interview people in the hiring process. So if you got a business administration degree or an emphasis in HR or communications or anything else, there's no college courses for this. No, you're right. I mean, just the HR degree in itself is becoming new, right? Like it's just becoming something that's new. So now say, now go further inside of the HR space, which TA falls in that. That's a different argument and where TA should fall. That's, that's yeah. I can yeah. go on for hours well, yeah. about that. You and I agree on this. They're two <laughs> completely different departments in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So now you sit there and go, it's even that the, the, the mindset of what TA is, how we do it. I have some of my, some of my favorite people to follow on LinkedIn. I'll give the selfish, selfish plug to Trent, Trent Cotton. I don't know if you do, do it, but he has a fantastic mindset of using essentially lean manufacturing type of principles into That's TA. How do you, how do you make this efficient? so that both sides feel that they're being valued in their time and everything like that. And it's sprint recruiting is what he calls it. And it's, this is such a new space that I think there is going to be growth to what you say, college classes and stuff like that. But we, I think we're years away. 
right? Yeah. So how well, we do it? I mean, th- th- this is how my journey came. I was 16. I was the captain of my football team. I got, for some reason, they elected me student body president of the whole high school. I'd never been involved in like student <laughs> government or anything. I was actually kind of a misfit. Like, you know, they nearly kicked me out of school and off the football team the whole nine yards. But, you know, I found myself in these leadership roles, maybe because I'm a bit extroverted, did not belong in any sort of leadership role. I still probably don't belong in any leadership kind Same. of roles. But, <laughs> but they just, I, you know, I found myself in these places. But, and I, and I grappled, I grabbed onto this concept that if you put the, put the right people on the bus, you get the right people in the organization, whether it's your football team or what, I mean, look at the Patriots. Oh my God. I mean, or, uh, and I'm not a Patriot. <laughs> <laughs> Niners fan, <laughs> but they do a really good job too. Uh, yeah. But no, you get the right people on the team, you get the right people on the bus, and great things are going to happen in the organization. I mean, look at Elon Musk. I mean, so there so, might be some haters out there in the guy, but dude, he convinced the smartest people in the world to work 80 hours a week for well below market price to help accomplish his mission of putting people on Mars, right? Yeah. Like, uh, that's a shitty job. Think, frankly, actually, right? Those guys yeah. work like dogs, right? Yeah. yeah, he figured out how to assemble assemble those minds. And that's what, quite frankly, what you just said is part of the reason that once I got into TA, why I got so excited about it is because it's how do you assemble these minds? I mean, I remember in our pre-call that we talked about, I said, at the end of the day, I call talent acquisition, the ability to be how fast and efficiently and well, can you build a human relationship between two people to solve a business problem? The business problem for the company, obviously, there wouldn't open a position if there wasn't a business problem. And the candidate, I don't care anybody says, I equate it to business, whether they need a job, they want to pay bills, they need to get out of a toxic, toxic job, whatever it may be, that's a business problem. And how quickly and efficiently can we bring those together? Yeah. Unfortunately, there's so many people that don't don't know how to do it. And that's not their fault. That's not what they're geared for. That's not what they were hired to do. So you don't train on it. I mean, even the business coaches. So, you know, on my podcast and other webinars I do, and no offense to all my business coach friends out there, a lot of them, but they're, you know, they teach about like mission, vision, alignment, processes, EOS, scaling up all these different like models and systems and processes. And they do touch on talent acquisition, but they don't, it's, uh, it's, even they are not in the weeds in there doing it day in and day and out and actually creating systems process. You have a system and process for every part of your business in most cases, but often how acquisition is forgotten about. Yep. It makes no sense. Oh, I always tell everybody in my personal opinion, outside of direct sales, talent acquisition will have more of an effect on your bottom line than any other department in the industry, in the, in the, in the, in the organization. Yeah. A lot of people are going to not like me saying that, but yeah. ask a hiring manager if they hire the right person, what it does to their department, their efficiencies, their product, all of those things. Ask that same hiring managers what's happened to their department, their product, their efficiencies if they hired the wrong person. Yeah. You can directly correlate it to how much money is coming in. I, I call it a million dollar hire, right? Yeah. So I believe every hire is worth a million dollars to a company. I honestly believe that. And, you know, you guys, people can say well, you're freaking crazy, but <laughs> you put sales in front of people and I don't do that. Like, no offense, <laughs> but think about it. Well, who you got to hire the sales guy or gal. Yeah. You a million dollar a year quota. Absolutely. Get the wrong one in. They don't produce a million dollars. You just lost a million dollars or you don't fill that role. It goes on fill. That's a million dollars in unrealized revenue. If they have a million dollar year quota, yeah. right? No, you nailed it. And so I guess you, pr- I mean, the way you said it is exactly how I believe. I think you did. Yeah. We just, same thing. Different, <laughs> I know, I know. Maybe different way to say it, right? <laughs> so it's the truth though. I mean, if you don't have the right people and hire the right people, your, your company is going to be affected negatively. Do you, and so many, many companies, uh, C-suites, I mean, I look, again, run these, you see these polls over there all the time. Like you ask any CEO, what is the most important, uh, you know, part of their business? What do you think they're going to say? Uh, they'll always say people. Yes. <laughs> they always say people, right? <laughs> do you think they really put their money where their mouth is? And I'm calling out CEOs all over the world here. And I'm going to get, I'm going to get totally burned at the stake for this one. But do you really think many of them are putting their money where their mouth is on that? 
let's just say that uh, there are some, and that means that it's not all. So <laughs> I'll let you infer what I mean yeah, by that. Yeah, yeah. There's, it's, uh, it's, it's the hard part, right? It's, do I invest in more people knowing that if I invest in the right people, I'm going to get the return? Yeah. Or am I able to knowing that I have to front the money, right? Like, let's be honest, no matter what anybody says, there's the risk versus reward. And it's where does a CEO live in the mindset of how much risk can I take waiting for the reward? Yeah. Um, I think a majority of time when it comes to people, people in the C-suite, they make the best decision they can with the information at hand. But I believe sometimes you do see it be short-sighted. You're like, yeah. you, if you would have just continued to invest in the right people, yeah. the return would come quicker. Yeah. And that's where, like, when you talk about talent assessments and things of that nature, that's why I call them a very powerful tool. Yeah. It can be a very powerful tool if you use them the right way. They can also be extremely dangerous. I've watched companies use talent assessment tools for the detriment of an organization yeah. when they and they didn't even know it. And I'm sure you see that all the time in your business where you're like, you guys aren't seeing what we're trying to do with yeah. these things. I mean, talent assessment to me, I mean, as much as, as there are assessment tests, assessment tools, to me is a holistic process of starting with that job description, the OKRs, KPIs, which again, most job descriptions don't include those. And I'm a huge Lou Adler fan. I, I don't know if you follow his stuff much, but I, I mean, he was one of my early inspirations. And I mean, he talked, this, I learned this from him, right? You create job description, solve a problem, right? What is the problem yep. with OKR, right? And then what are the KPIs that are going to drive success towards those OKRs, right? And and first of all, we got to do that, right? But you can't assess somebody until you've got that part, right? <laughs> you know? And, yeah. And so and again, this is where the contingency model for me breaks down, right? As a contingency recruiter, I don't really give a shit about those things. Excuse my French, guys. Uh, but no, you, you get rewarded for placing more people. So yeah. are you that, and, and you have to do it within, um, right. You have to do it within a certain amount of time or the other contingency recruiter is going to fill it quicker than you. And then yeah. guess what? Happens? Now you're really in trouble. So it becomes how many people can I submit in a very quick manner of time that can at least check enough boxes, check enough boxes for them to hire. And then I'll collect the big check. Yep. Right. There we've, we talked about this before. There are some great ones out there that they do a lot of the things that we're talking about. There is a reason why there is an issue with the contingency model as a whole and why we're, why we're even having this conversation. If yeah. the model didn't have people that have gone to where they just see their candidate and their client as dollar signs, as opposed to seeing the person in front of them, we wouldn't be talking. Yeah. That is the problem. There are too many people with the contingency model that sit there and say, well, I'm just going to keep throwing you until you until you bite, right? It's like fishing. Just keep throwing the bite, the bait. Eventually someone's going to bite. And I don't care how big it is or how little it is, just keep biting. Yeah. And, and that has to be broken. And that's the one thing that I like about our model is we'll fill as many roles as we possibly can in a given set of time. And it disincentivizes the uh, everybody involved to do the right things. And, and so if I'm a hiring manager and I hire three contingency recruiters to go out there and they start throwing a bunch of spaghetti against the wall, right? And, you know, then I start to get a little jaded, right? I start to go, oh, there's a bunch of garbage, bunch of garbage, bunch of garbage. And then when somebody actually does present a good candidate, they can't see the diamond in the rough, right? I'm jaded because I just reviewed 25 resumes. And they're all garbage. So, so-called great candidates. And then the one person that does do it the right way, like we've talked about, or a model like ours, where we come in in this way and we really assess now our people are looked at jaded. Yeah. They, they're very upset because they're already, they already distrust the outside search firm, whatever model your model is, there's a distrust built. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I, to go back to our model, what I like is I'll have a kickoff call with a client and I'll tell them flat out, Hey, if you're telling me I'm starting from scratch, which means I don't get to review applicants. You have not had anybody um, doing this. I'm going to be up front and tell you, you may not see a candidate for two weeks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I tell people 45 days to 90 days to fill it. I mean, depending on the role and the situation, yeah. especially in the beginning, if you're starting from scratch, right? Like yep. if you find if you find the ideal candidate for somebody, and hopefully it doesn't take this long, but the reality is it does, right? Like you give, you hand me my ideal candidate tomorrow, we start a search. There's at least a two week assessment process going on right inter in multiple interviews assessment tests reference checks working interviews a panel interview whatever it is appropriate for the role there's 
you know, the different, I believe there's kind of different paths, slightly different paths depending on the situation, right? If I hire a barista, a different path than hiring a CMO for my new medical device company, right? Absolutely. You, you um, nailed it. You nailed it. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things that that's why I think what we do is we, I, I say it's building, as someone put in the question, which I love the question seeing it is how do you build this trust gap, right? Because if you're battling this contingency search model and you're trying to do it differently, how do you do it differently? And how do you build this trust? So they view you as a true expert. I, I'll be honest with you. I call it be, be extremely truthful. Yeah. Here's my true expectations. I'm, I always tell my team and I train my team, train my team to build trust. You have to set true expectations get a verbal agreement on the true expectations for both sides, send a follow-up email on both sides, and then you can start the process. It and doesn't reiterate it at each meeting with the client too, right? I mean, it yeah. doesn't, doesn't end, right? It's a constant no. thing. It's, it, it, it's the communication process as you go. Like I know at times how I work naturally is you tell me to do something, I'm going to go do it and I'm going to come back and I'll do it when I'm done. Well, I've learned through failing my clients don't like it. And I equate it, they, they want to know what I'm doing as I'm going along. Yeah. You have to set up communication parameters, communication sequences, cadences. And by doing that to that trust question, now if I set my expectations, I get agreement, I follow up, and then I communicate against those, those expectations that we set all along, the results are going to take what, how long they're going to take, as you said. Everybody at least is on the same page and they can't say they didn't know. Yeah, because each week when you meet with the client and say, okay, client, this is what we did. Here was our activity, reportable, measurable activity. Here was the outcome. Okay, if that outcome wasn't the, the end result that we were hoping for, then you're now accountable. So just like you worked for them, like in their office, yeah. right? Like if I had a talent acquisition person working for me in my office, every week I would meet with that person, right? And I would say, okay, what'd you do last week? And what are you going to do next week, Right. <laughs> Yep, and, absolutely. Okay, that didn't work last week. What are you going to do differently next week yeah. to change the result, right? Absolutely. And 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 that's that's how we build the gap. We 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 bridge the gap. Yeah. Because typically hiring managers in my opinion, they want the position filled with the right person and just someone's burned them along the way. Yeah. yeah. And I have to overcome that unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And I have to put in my mechanisms to do it. Yeah. And I I love so, you know, I think that the hiring managers, when they're paying contingency, first of all, they've got no skin in the game, right? So, yep. you know, they, a lot of times they're not that super engaged. Like, I mean, again, you send a candidate, they don't respond for three days. And next thing you know, finally they respond. And then the candidate's already found another job, right? And again, as me as a contingent recruiter, I'm like, I'm mad, I'm pissed off. And now I'm like, it just totally jaded the process. And then, I mean, I've heard clients saying, hey, my recruiter basically ghosted me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, go figure. You didn't pay them <laughs> to do their yeah, job. I mean, right? you know, what is it? The squeaky wheel always gets the grease, right? So if I have a client that is being receptive and listening to me, and I'm a contingency one, and they're hiring multiple people, and da 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 da, who am I giving my best candidates to? Them yeah. or the one that I send to the, the to the hiring manager, and I don't hear back for a week? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, I'm going to yeah. keep sending you my C and D candidates, but my A and B are over here because they're paying me a ridiculous amount of money because they're responsive and the, yeah. the process is working right. That's that's natural human instinct. I'm not going to lie and tell you that early in my career when I was in contingency, that's not what I did yeah. because I'm like, you don't value my time. This company does. So guess who gets my energy? Yeah. So that's how you can make a contingency recruiter work for you. I mean, if you want to go that route and you want to pay 20, 30%, you know, and maybe that works and maybe there's, it's appropriate to you to do that in some circumstances, much as a hater of it, I am, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, every, nobody take me too seriously, folks. I, I, I like to go out on a limb, I'm, but, but, but I, I really hate it with a passion. Like, I think it's just terrible for like humanity, but, um, uh, but look, if you are going to make it work, it's to, you know, have that communication and have that tight communication in the channel and, and to build a process with each other, the recruiter and the hiring manager, right. And, and those two, but I think your model forces that, right. I imagine if, if, if you came to work for me and you went to hire me, whatever CMO or a whole marketing team, for example, yep. you know, if I didn't show up to my weekly meeting with you, if I didn't respond, I mean, you're going to hold me accountable for that, I would assume, right? 
Absolutely. And that's why I always say, that's why I say set true expectations. The first, and let me take a step back. This is kind of how, if you were my client, I would come in and we'd have a kickoff meeting to describe how we're different. Yeah. I would initially come back and say exactly what we agreed upon. Okay, we're going to do, we're going to do full cycle recruiting for you. And that means that we're going to do candidate identification, candidate engagement, candidate screening, and then lead them through the off, the interview process through offer. Yeah. And we're going to say, yes, absolutely. I'm going to make a note of that. Then I'm going to say, what is the ultimate win here outside of filling positions? I'm only here because I ultimately know you want me to fill positions, but what is it that you're trying to change inside of your organization? What's the real root cause of having to go outside? Right. Yeah. And then I'm going to get that. And then I'm going to make a note of it. And then I'm going to go through and say, okay, let's talk about the role and say, describe the person to me. And then literally I would say, okay, within 24 to 48 hours, I'm going to send you a list of 10 profiles. These are just profiles, people I have not spoken to that I feel match at least the words that we talked about. Yeah. And then, and if you agree that I know the profile that you want based yeah. on that, we'll have another call. Either We'll either have a call to go through it or we will do it in detail through email. Once we agree that I know that, I'm gonna follow up with an email, all the expectations of what my role is that I'm gonna do for you, what it is that we're looking to do, what the ultimate win is, and the response from the calibration list. Mm -hmm. And now I'm gonna to go to work and I'm going to update you at least once, probably twice a week on my progress and where we're going. Yeah. If that was the process I described to you, would you be like, <laughs> okay, that was yeah, it sounds fantastic to me, right? You know? Yeah. And I'm the one and I'm bringing the, and the cool thing is, is we're bringing the tools, all the fun, fancy sourcing tools, yeah. candidate information tools. You don't have to worry about that. You literally get to just say, here's my problem with the people that yeah. I need. Go find it and be a true partner. Yeah. And, I'm gonna, and then you just said it perfectly. Hold me accountable and I'm going to hold you accountable. This yeah. is not a transactional relationship. This is an actual business relationship where we're both pushing to get to the right end for both yeah. parties. Like I worked in your office, like you would treat any internal partner, right? And you would, you would operate very similarly. And what I love about you know, the last piece of this, what I love, and before we get into some kind of wrap up stuff, it is, is, I mean, I think this is where our two worlds really converge here because my kind of goal in life is to enable organizations to win at hiring and to, to, to take ownership of that process, right? I want to give people the tools, the systems, the ideas. That's why I do these, you know, webinars. I want to teach people some great ideas, right? I mean, I can give you all the tools in the world, but it's like anybody in like marketing world, HubSpot people or like Salesforce, those two platforms are very, very powerful, right? If they are. <laughs> but if you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> They're pretty much as useless as a hundred thousand dollar brick in your front yard, right? You know, you're not lying about that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? So, you know, any good a ATS or any good, you know, we call it a performance hiring system, right? Uh, software because we think it's a, what we uh, what we do is a lot more than an applicant tracking system, right? We don't believe uh, applicant tracking is kind of a bad word in my language, but some people know what we're talking about. We offer performance hiring. But that is the engine. And then we have to then educate. And we love the HubSpot model because we do think HubSpot does a great job of educating their user base, unlike Salesforce. Yes. Salesforce has a whole other thing, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, at least HubSpot's like educate, educate first, educate first. And that's one of our core values. We want to educate people on best practices so that when they get the engine, the tool, the Ferrari, that they can use it effectively and they can speed up the mountain and not fly off the cliff with it, right? Or whatever. Or it doesn't sit in their front yard useless, right? You know, um, so I love that part. So tell me a little bit about that, you know, because this isn't always a forever thing for you, right? You get people to a point oftentimes where they become self-sufficient, right? Yeah, that's actually one of our, we always say that um, we're on demand. And the reason we're on demand is hiring levels off Hiring teams get up to speed or hiring teams get, we help them get it under control. And I'm not there to replace. Like that's the first thing that I always try to tell people, especially when I talk to an internal recruiter, being an internal recruiter that had their manager when I was a first internal recruiter, bring an outside firm to help me. I freaked out. I thought it meant that I was losing my job, right? Like I was like, they're bringing someone in because I'm a failure. So I am perfectly upfront saying, hey, I'm not here to replace you. This is the situation that we're coming into. Look at me as the person that's going to come in and take this spike in hiring that you have to do, get it under control so that you can do what you're good at. 
you are, you are extremely strong at being able to, you know, the company better than me. You fill tons of roles with the company. There's just a, a lot of roles that you can't get to. So I'm going to take care of that while you do the rest of your job and you can do it effectively. And then when that's done, you know, cause a lot of it's done over video, I'm going to air high five you and I'm going to go do it for another client. And I'm going to, we, I, it's kind of like what they say when you go to the park, right? Leave the park bench better than when you got there, yeah. clean up after yourself. That's what we're going to try to do. We're going to make sure they have the metrics that they want. We're going to make sure that the data, if they want us to work inside of their ATS is cleaned up and efficient. So they know where we're at. And I'm just going to tidy it up, give an air high five and say, Hey, Let's stay in touch just in case this happens again, or if there's roles that you can't get to because maybe you're a you're a finance recruiter and they happen to be building out a tech product and you're like, I don't, that's gibberish to me. So <laughs> yeah. call us, we'll come in, help and do the same thing and we'll we'll move on. Um, and we've done that. We've helped set up talent acquisition departments for companies. In yeah. fact, a lot of people think it's weird. We actually hire their recruiting team so they can remove us. And some yeah. people are like, Aren't yeah. you getting rid of your own business? And I'm like, that's not our model. Yeah, because you're going to end up with a happy client who's going to refer you to somebody else. And when they do need you, they're going to come back reliably and happily. And and then, you know, it's just, a, a, a yeah, it's just such, such an amazing system and model that you guys do. So look, uh, Emilio, you know, if you can drop Adam's contact information in there for into in the, in the uh, LinkedIn Live, and if, you, and if anybody's looking for a better you know, mousetrap or you're a small business and you're starting to think about, you know, formalizing hiring process, drop our link in there. You can chat with us and talk to us about our performance hiring system. Uh, but again, you know, there's kind of, you know, we both play a role here and help you guys can come in and start solving the problem today. And we want to help kind of create also just like you create that foundation for people. So that they have a system and a process and the tools and that they can be successful with them. And we want to, you know, you know, both in both cases, we want to see people win at hiring, right? Oh, that is, that's it. Right. I feel that I'm out here um, to be on this earth just to help people. Yeah. And I'm pretty, it's pretty cool that I get to be in a profession where literally my job is to help people find jobs or help companies yeah. feel that. So I feel like I'm doing it on so many levels. Building and, families. I mean, you know, some people, you know, talk about, you know, nonsensical families, like no community, you know, if you don't want to call it a family, call it a community, right? You yes, a hundred percent. And I want to help in any way I can, even if it's, Hey, we have a department. I don't have tons of hiring, but you talked about processes. Well, let's talk processes. Um, I am all about efficiency because efficiencies help you get to the ending quicker, which is huge for my brain. Two, it helps make the hiring manager and the candidate have a better experience. I'm very big on, I've had clients, they're like, yeah, we have eight rounds of interviews. And I'm like, well, wait a second now. <laughs> why, are we, why are we interviewing eight people? And then I start talking, let's add value to the interviewing process. If, you, if there's eight rounds of interviews or eight people that have to interview, and there's true value. Well, that's different. I can explain that to the candidate and the candidate. But you can consolidate that. Like, I mean, I'm a huge fan of work, what I call working interviews, which isn't, it's not the best word for it, but it's like you bring the person in for half a day or a whole day. I mean, again, depends on the role, depends on the situation. Yeah. Hire a CMO, they might bring them in there for three days. Jeez. Yeah. You know? But like, you know, but you bring them in there for a period of time where you get to get to work together. You get to get to meet people. You could have eight different interviewers now because they're here and I've, I've blocked half a day or whole day to do that now it's efficient not yes. like oh imagine eight interviews i mean that could take like three months you know to get well <laughs> it was funny because you mentioned it you're like adam if i presented a candidate for your role today for the exact perfect candidate and i sit there and go yep okay well let's just say it's a it's going to take at least two weeks to go through my interviews the value added efficient interviews based on people's schedules, I have to be flexible. And then if that's the right person, they ask for a three, a three week notice to their current organization, I'm at five weeks. And right. I had the candidate on day one. So now I'm sitting there going like, this is why we talk about, you have to have a, pres, a strong process. You have to set true expectations because let's be honest, I'm not gonna hand you the perfect candidate day one of starting yeah. to screen. So it's how possible. do I add that to it, right? And that's- I did and, that once. I did that once, by the way, as a recruiter. The person I interviewed, I presented and got hired. And we interviewed a lot of other people after that. It was literally yeah. the first guy, first resume, first guy I scheduled an interview for uh, when I was doing a recruiting athlete. And it, it, the guy still works for the company. This is like oh. years ago that I did this. <laughs> yeah, it's 
we call those unicorn searches, yeah. right? Where you, you're like, I found the person in the first call and everybody looks at you like, there's no way we have to interview three people. And they go, is that first person still available? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Luckily, <laughs> the client was pretty smart and you saw what I saw. But no, we did have the, we did interview other people. We did present other people just to be like, okay, yeah. by the way, well, here's what else you got. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. But we had to keep that one moving. Uh, whoa, uh, something's in danger. <laughs> um, okay, so look, this is, you know, we, you know, I think we talked about this in our briefing call, but we, you and I could probably talk all day. Too bad you live in Georgia. Uh, I live in California, but, you know, if you ever make it out this way, come to Disneyland, uh, I'm happy to take you out for a beer or whatever, but we yes. shop all day long. So uh, I always like to end these uh, calls with three actionable tips that you would give to an organization or a hiring manager to improve their hiring process that they could implement like tomorrow, hypothetically, you know, like quickly, right? You know, what, yeah. what would those be? The first thing would make sure you have an efficient process, yeah. an efficient process, right? Take a um, look at what it is. Is there friction? Is there, is it working right? Someone put in the comments, like a value added efficient process. There is nothing better when a candidate from the very beginning, you tell them exactly what the process is, how it's going to work and how feedback is going to be presented. And it goes through that way. Um, the other part, if you have a TA team, internally make them your partner bring them to every meeting you possibly can when it talks about people working in your organization if yeah. you have an outside partner however it is i would love to talk to you about iq talent and how we can do it bring the people bring the people that are going to go find your people to hire to the meetings yeah. bring them to your stand-ups bring them to a product demo to talk about the passion behind the product that you guys work on whether it's a software product or not and then my last one Full transparency, you interview someone, you think they vibe with your team, they fit a culture fit, and they're good for the job, hire them. Don't yep. look for the next best person because you'll be looking for the next best person for the next six months and you miss out on six months of return. And as you said, Fletcher, if someone doesn't fill a job, specifically if you did say it was sales, it could cost you a million dollars. If you hire the wrong person, it could cost you a million dollars. If the person's right and they happen to be the first person you interviewed or was submitted, hire them. But if you have that process, right, that system, yes. then you'll know, right, if it's the right person or not. And it won't matter who else is out there because you followed your process, your scorecard, you've had, you know, the, your system for evaluating people. And if they're checking all the boxes along that, the way, then they've checked the box you hire. Them, right? I love that, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so those uh, would be my three quick tangible ones away. And I will say the biggest one, though, is your TA team needs to be part of the process. Your yeah. TA team needs to be looked at not as separate. They yeah. are part of. And if yeah. the, you watch the you company- You should be like hiring. that with them because yeah. they're the most value, they're the most important asset to your company or the people are, and they're the, the gateway to getting that done. Unless you want to do it yourself. Go ahead, go do it yourself, yeah. man. Like, Absolutely. Knock yourself yeah. out, right? You know, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. So, and I want to make an extra point on that. I meant to talk about earlier, but we were talking about so many fun things. I, I, and I believe this strongly. And again, maybe I'll get crucified for this, but you know, I think talent acquisition deserves a seat in the C-suite in the boardroom. And that's where they belong in an organization. There, you'll never hear me argue other than yes, <laughs> you're hundred percent right. And again, that's why I say the companies that hire the best, their TA team is part of it. They're yeah. part of the team. They are part of every aspect. If they're talking about budgeting for the next year and hiring, the TA team is sitting there first and they're probably, they should be the first conversation. Yeah. Then you bring it to the broader audience. Yeah. We have to, to hire well, we have to change the way it's been done for years inside of the corporate space. Otherwise, it's going to continue to be the same problem. They're going to continue to dismiss recruiting as we don't know what we're doing. The companies that bring us along and want us to be part of it and view us as an expert, just like we do with their job, we view them as the yeah. expert. You have a They're CMO and a CFO and a CTO sitting up there. You know, you should have a CPA. <laughs> I, I agree with you. I think it. the companies that do it and embrace it, it you can see it inside the organization. Yeah. I've been to some companies, uh, some clients. I had a client that um, I was fortunate enough, they flew me out to their headquarters in California one time and I was like, um, this team's different. And I, and I knew why the head of TA was in every meeting. Yeah. It was fantastic. They're part so. of the, they're part of the C-suite. They're part of the decision-making. They're part of the strategic planning of the organization. 
because it's and they so care more. Part of it. Your it's, recruiter will your recruiter will care more. Yeah. It's just there's no other way to say it. They will yeah. care more if they they feel part of your team. Yeah. And when a recruiter cares more, I can promise you they perform better. Well, yeah, it comes across when they deal with the candidates too, right? I mean, if you deal with a recruiter who's tired and they interviewed ten people today, and you know they're just running through the motions, like. As a candidate, they're not putting on a great impression, right? You know, absolutely. Yeah. You know, but if they're enthusiastic, you know, then uh, and like super stoked to be here, and it's like can't wait to spread the word about how great this organization is. Then you're going to feel that as a candidate on the other side, and you're going to be like, you know what? I'm going to spend a little more time thinking about this opportunity versus that one over there, right? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. You're right. It's just contagious across the board, as you said. Um, so. All right, guys, look, I, I don't like to keep these so long. This is such a fun conversation, Adam. Um, we're going to share this, uh, the links, the recordings of this. They'll be on YouTube. They'll be on LinkedIn. Uh, Adam, your team will get a copy of the raw footage. You guys can do like with it. Uh, we'll follow up after all that. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This just made my day. Appreciate your time. And uh, happy hunting, as I like to say. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been my pleasure and my honor. I can't believe that I got to sit with you today, Fletcher. This yeah. is fantastic. And uh, I hope we get to do it again. Awesome. See ya. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye.